So I think we'll get started if people are willing to stick with us for one more panel. This is a, no, maybe it's not. I was going to say it's a shorter panel, but maybe it's not. All right, we'll get started. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Many of you who have spent the whole day with us, we've been talking yesterday during the day. We were talking about elements of global collaboration and particularly around the hubs, how we can create a productive network, how we can build on the start we've already made, how we can incorporate research and teaching into the kind of uh, agreements and into the relationships that we take going forward. So really exciting day yesterday with a network meeting. And then we've had four and now a fifth panel for our Global Grand Challenges Symposium. This symposium, as you all know, is really intended to help us think about some of the greatest challenges in front of all of us, in front of all of us in particular places, but also as a global community. The challenges will play out differently depending on where we are, and I think we've heard over and over again the dangers of a single story, um, just the difficulty of learning from just one perspective and the value of having these multiple perspectives. In our different panels for this grand challenge portion of the two days, we've discussed everything from international collaboration to um, thinking about water from multiple perspectives, thinking about space, thinking about health. And all of these are challenges that our guest speakers, and I think all of us would agree, are playing out in different ways in our own locations, and that in some way require that we think about them together. What we would love to do at the end of the day not at the end of this day, but after this day is over, um, is to be able to think, you know, what makes sense going forward? What kind of challenges could we tackle together? And what would that look like across our different institutions? So I'm really excited. The conversations have been great. Um, and I'm excited for this last panel, which will really wrap things up for us. They have kind of a tall order, both because it's the end of a couple of long days, and now it's already deep into the night for some of our um, partners who traveled here from other time zones. But the, the purpose of this panel is to now reflect back on the preceding two days, the challenges and also the network building, and really to think about what makes for a productive partnership. And not just at a sort of general level of thinking about how we would all sort of like to get along and, and collaborate, but really some of the naughty questions. By that, I meant like a knot that you tie. <laughs> not naughty, it's not that time of day. Um, the, the difficult questions, right, of we value multiple perspectives, and then what happens when those are difficult to reconcile in a particular project, right? How do we think about the way that we negotiate when one um, group sees a particular problem from their perspective and wants everybody to engage around a project um, along lines that might then be um, more singular and don't necessarily pull in all of the different perspectives. I think a lot about our um, embrace of global collaborations and how we believe in um, having our students and having our researchers be in other contexts and live in really different um, spaces where understandings of what are good relationships or um, understanding of what a particular individual is, a woman's role in that society, or um, children, or thinking about different questions of tension around class or race or what have you. These are really difficult questions that look very different in different places. And so we develop as international scholars a real, um, not just comfort with, but embrace of different ways of seeing these questions. But it is also true that then we need to think about this somewhat universalizing language that we bring to our memoranda of understanding or our overarching ideas about partnership. So how do we navigate those tricky tensions on the ground? How do we make sure 
that our partnerships really are equal and that we trust each other enough to be able to have disagreements without that, you know, canceling out the relationship, but that then allow us to have a good conversation. So, you know, a tall order for 3.30 on the second day <laughs> for all of you. Um, I am going to just introduce them one by one and ask them to come up here because it's easier for the online audience to hear everyone. We'll hear first um, from Eric Ose Asibe, who's the Dean of International Programs, also Professor of Economics and former head of the Department of Distance Education at the University of Ghana. Eric, thank you so much. Right. Um, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, I really love your campus. It's so amazing. Uh, I love everything I've seen so far, uh, except one, the weather. <laughs> <laughs> the weather was a shock to us. But really, uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank you uh, for uh, bringing us here, especially to Wendy, the um, uh, uh, Vice Provost of, for International Affairs, and Rachel, and the Noble team here at uh, Cornell. Uh, so, um, Really, as you mentioned, we are here to kind of wrap up. And um, as was discussed yesterday, and uh, I think the president also mentioned, and Rachel mentioned in her presentation, uh, as we here gathered here and trying to uh, grapple with how to address the pertinent global issues, I think one thing was clear, that it's well acknowledged that global challenges definitely will require global solution uh, from all of us. And therefore, global institutions like us uh, that have gathered here uh, definitely will be useful, will provide that unique platform uh, for us to think about very intractable uh, global challenges, as we have discussed, food insecurity, uh, health issues, as we saw um, this morning, uh, climate crisis that really affecting our water bodies and uh, several other organic uh, nature that we have, war conflicts, as we have seen in Russia and Ukraine wars, uh, that's really affecting uh, global macroeconomic instability and all of that. We've seen extreme poverty and widening inequalities across the globe. This is a huge global challenge that has to be solved. And of course, displacement and refugees and other things that uh, comes after. Now, these intractable problems, as you know, uh, which definitely shortens our lives, uh, impede on our socioeconomic uh, development, and affect our well-being as uh, humans. It, but really, the stark reality is that, and I would say that it goes without saying, that most of these intractable problems that we've talked about will be much felt in Africa. And therefore, I dare to say that the solution may well also uh, be found in Africa. That is why my university is really delighted uh, to be part of this uh, discourse that we are working or seeking to work in partnership uh, to addressing uh, these uh, global challenges in order to find cutting edge solutions uh, to many of these uh, problems. But the question that keep recurring, and Wendy has often referred to um, earlier, how do we productively and impactfully collaborate uh, to deliver on this objective of addressing uh, global challenges? You agree with me uh, that the institutions in the global north and global south have different circumstances, really. Uh, we have cultural differences. Uh, resources and institutions, why disparities between this? Um, we have differences in scholarly norms and ideologies, and therefore this really, to a large extent, can affect the way we collaborate and can impede and serve as a challenge to our ability to effectively uh, collaborate on. This notwithstanding, as has been proven in many instances, diversity is a precondition for excellence and success for collaboration like ours, the Global Hub Network. A strong international 
uh, collaboration, I believe, builds on each other's strength uh, in many ways. And so our network must therefore leverage the strength of its component parts. And that, what this really suggests is that every one of our institutions uh, should put their best foot forward in a way that will be able to fully share uh, what they have for the greater good of the network. It's key. Assuring Cornell's leading role in driving this international research collaboration on global challenges, increasing diversity as a driver for excellence, ensuring students are future ready in rapidly changing world uh, will help the network to provide impactful and sustainable solution to the inherent challenges in the four themes that we have looked at, knowledge, water, health, and space that have been so very well articulated and excellently discussed over the last uh, couple of days. We can collaboratively and ambitiously offer this through the future of education. Uh, if we look at uh, using um, AI, integrating AI and deep learning, machine learning into our education, research, we can look at research across discipline, across uh, institutions, across country, and then more importantly, in my view, look at this, uh, uh, how it affects community. Community extension services is key uh, because we have, whatever research that we conduct, we have to make sure that it trickle down uh, to the ordinary person, as uh, if I should borrow Barbara's word, to the ordinary person and how does it affect their livelihood. So, dear colleagues, in my considered view, Creating truly and mutually beneficial collaborative partnership hinders fundamentally on the following principle, which we have mentioned severally, but which I wish to reiterate, because I know it is key for any successful um, collaboration. Equal partnership, Wendy just mentioned, which are built on long-term commitment, trust, transparency, respect, and based on shared values such as integrity, equity, diversity, inclusion, academic freedom will be key. Second, complementarity of strength. Targeting mutually beneficial collaboration and bringing added value, the additionality, because we have to be able to leverage strength of our component parts uh, so that in the end we can add value uh, to each other's institutions and each other's profession. These are key. Ensuring an optimal balance between strategic top-down focus area and bottom-up initiative. We discussed that extensively uh, last time, and these are key to how do you bridge this uh, to situation. Commitment to actively widening knowledge production and critical investigation of potential source of inequality in global south and global uh, North collaborations, especially regarding funding opportunities, benefit hegemonies, intellectual output, data access. These are key. We heard that a lot today. And perhaps more importantly, as we heard yesterday, developing evaluation tools and establishing criteria for measuring resources. So in conclusion, as my time is up, I'll just jump to a quotation but that was read by uh, our past uh, president, the first prime minister of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who said, and I quote, the forces that unite us are intrinsic, greater than the forces that superimpose influences that keep us apart, unquote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Our second speaker today is Anika Gauja, who is the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences in the University of Sydney, Australia. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thanks to the um, Global Cornell team for hosting this wonderful symposium, and, and also thank you for the invitation um, to participate. So what I'm going to do, I think, is touch on a few of those naughty or naughty uh, questions uh, that Wendy prompted us to, and to, to really structure my few minutes around this theme of research and action, as, as prompted the title of the, of the session, and thinking through how we can get from research partnerships 
to programs for action. Um, picking up on one of the, the comments that we uh, canvassed yesterday is how do we change the world or how do we save the world um, based on many of the presentations we saw this morning. So to address grand challenges, um, many of which we've heard about uh, this morning, we need to have research excellence and cooperation, global knowledge exchange and training, uh, interdisciplinarity, bringing the physical sciences, humanities and the social sciences together. And we also need to contemplate um, curating our research partnerships so we're working constantly beyond the university with communities, governments and industry. Now, the perspective that I bring to thinking about international research collaboration is influenced by my background as a political scientist. So I'm constantly thinking about where power lies, not only in the research that I do, but in the partnerships that, that are established. But also, as an associate dean, my role really is to think about the design of initiatives and uh, how we can facilitate research in ways that will shape researchers' behaviour, um, hopefully to achieve desirable outcomes. So how do we move from research programs to action? So I'm going to canvas four sort of points or, or challenges and opportunities. Um, the first is one that Eric touched on and one that was very prominent in yesterday's discussion, and that is the issue of coordination. So how do we curate and organise our research from a grassroots perspective or a, a top-down perspective? Um, I think yesterday it, it felt to me that there was a consensus that grassroots perspectives yield excellent research. But I, I do want to push back a little bit on that and argue that actually curation is really, really important as well. And I think we have a responsibility as university administrators and senior leaders to think about how we can develop ways that we're working towards common problems. So questions that arise when we think about this are who should decide? Can we find common ground? Is it, is it possible? Um, but I think that uh, universities certainly do have a responsibility to actively identify the social, um, the political, the environmental, the scientific problems that we need to crack as researchers to map out the research and to basically match make researchers. So I think that this sort of initiative with a symposium strikes, I think, a very good balance between that top down and bottom up perspective. Um, the sustainable development goals, I think, are an interesting, again, raised this morning, an interesting tool in which to be able to do this and to think about universality, universality and how it can be used to curate our research. At Sydney University, we've established um, what we call the International Sustainable Development Goals Collaboration Program, uh, where we um, ask participants to include an international partner in their research, to think about the, the diversity of their research teams, therefore curating bottom-up research, but in a way that we're walking, working towards addressing common problems. And I think that's another really important shift in our thinking, is to really address problems, so problem-based research. Um, in terms of, uh, again, of, of curation um, and research collaboration is the issue of, of diversity. So, Taking the idea that the best research collaborations emerge organically, to my mind that doesn't necessarily create the diversity that we need from our research relationships. Diversity that we know is cru crucial for producing meaningful knowledge and a more inclusive and democratic exchange of ideas. So without curation, would we have collaborations between researcher X and researcher Y? I think the diversity of people and researchers in this room certainly isn't an accident. It has been very carefully curated to, to try to achieve those diverse perspectives. So I think there's a real tension there between the strategy of pursuing excellence, allowing this grassroots research to develop, but also pushing us beyond the people, the researchers that we would ordinarily work with. The second big problem that I want to raise is the, the issue of money and following the money. So I think we need to think about international collaboration programs in the broader context of research funding and the global landscape. Funding drives research activity. With the exception of a few universities where, um, you know, that are very, very well endowed and that can fund research and research outcomes, universities need to find a way of securing external funding. And some universities have very, very little of that. Um, 
And I, I'm surprised that very few schemes at their heart truly facilitate international cooperation. So the EU, we heard this morning, is an example of, of where that occurs, but essentially we get regional outcomes. That doesn't solve the problem of inequality between the global north and the global south. In Australia, we've had a really vigorous debate around national interest being central to um, government funding of research. And to conceptualise your research in terms of the national interest, when governments evaluate it, it's very, very difficult to convince them that international collaboration is actually in that national interest. Um, so really, I think there's some very important questions to think about in terms of um, money there. And then finally, um, I wanted to raise the point of advocacy. So thinking about universities and researchers as potential political actors. And this was something that was also touched on um, this morning when we talked about uh, sustainability and environmental challenges. Um, universities, I think, have a social responsibility not only to identify those problems, but to undertake important advocacy work in two respects. The first is to engineer policy change by disseminating research, um, by lobbying governments, lobbying supranational institutions to change policy, to change international agreements uh, in line with uh, what research teaches us. But also to think about how we as researchers can better lobby organisations uh, to provide additional funding for research. And this goes to the problem that I spoke of earlier around the national incentives, the national funding schemes being inadequate to cope with global problems. So if we use that rational choice approach that research is driven by money, driven by those incentives, and I mean that's you know, not just driven, but it's a, an important part of it, we really need to do more work lobbying governments, lobbying international organisations and lobbying philanthropists and industry to help us on that journey. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Anika. So our third speaker today is Ruben Wong. He's the Associate Vice President of Global Relations for the National University of Singapore. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Wendy, for uh, organizing this uh, Global uh, Hubs launch. I, um, uh, I think I, we met several times on Zoom, and I had a, a, a very hard time trying to understand what the whole Global Hubs uh, idea was about. Uh, Gustavo came to Singapore a few months ago, so uh, that was helpful for me to, to understand that you're not talking about physical infrastructure or even uh, uh, Cornell uh, satellites in, in, in different parts of the world, but really uh, places where you have uh, networks and, and um, <clears throat> concentrations of partners that you can work with uh, for research, for collaboration, and exchanges of ideas. Um, I just wanted to focus uh, in a bit on uh, two of the uh, ideas that we've discussed uh, of the four. Um, <clears throat> uh, they are on water and health. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, uh, maybe what I'll, I'll do is just very quickly say a bit about what NUS or Singapore is interested in, uh, and that, that perhaps could help us to uh, um, understand what, what I, I see uh, it could be, uh, how it could be helpful uh, uh, for us to co uh, cooperate. Um, we are, of course, uh, very much into the interdisciplinary uh, thinking, and in fact, interdis interdisciplinarity has become uh, a very big thing for NUS. So um, I think yesterday or today I spoke to uh, a few colleagues here and uh, some of you were surprised that uh, out of eight semesters that a student has to take, uh, the first three have to be uh, on a core curriculum. So we're making sure that all our science students, our STEM students have some humanities and all our humanities and social science students know about digital, uh, have some uh, competence in digital uh, literacy. And we, we think this is important because the world economy is changing so fast. Te technology is moving so quickly that anything that the student learns within three or four years before they graduate might be very quickly overtaken. And you know the fact that people now have to uh, change jobs and over the course of their lifetime um, uh, do maybe 10 or 15 different jobs 
uh, that three or four years in university might not be enough to set them uh, on that tra trajectory. So uh, I'm very pleased to hear about the interdisciplinary thinking that, that Cornell is uh, very keen on and, and many uh, of partners here are doing as well. Um, uh, we think that uh, many of our graduates, uh, to be future ready, will have to be ready to uh, possibly change jobs uh, and uh, even change sectors or move to something completely different uh, within their lifetimes. Uh, so what we're uh, hoping to do is uh, within 20 years of their uh, graduating, they will be able to come back to NUS and uh, be able to retrain uh, to do a, a completely different job. And this is to help um, a phenomenon that we're seeing now that many uh, professionals and uh, mid-level executives uh, are losing their jobs in the 40s and 50s, you know, just at a time when they need to support their kids and their mortgages. Uh, and this is, this is a very bad and serious problem. Um, I'm not sure how bad it is for, uh, for your countries, but uh, it's a potentially social economic disaster for us. Uh, so we're preparing them for that. And um, some of the, uh, uh, the other grand challenges over the long term, uh, the, the water one, I think, really struck a chord with me, uh, the, the panel today, because water is uh, uh, critical to us as an island uh, country, an island state. Uh, we are affected by rising sea levels. Uh, we have a major problem with food security. Um, one of the uh, ambitious plans that Singapore has, uh, has made is to uh, have uh, about one third, 30 percent of our food locally produced by 2030. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> we, we import so much of our food from, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Australia, from all around the world. Uh, well, maybe because uh, we are picky eaters, so uh, <laughs> I'm not very sure that the food that we produce in Singapore is going to you know, be up to scratch. I, uh, I think some, many of our scientists have been trying to, uh, like here, do impossible burgers. Um, it might not be very possible to please the very uh, 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 high taste buds we have in Singapore with these impossible, but they don't quite taste like meat to me. Um, so, so that's another uh, big issue for us. And uh, uh, NUS has been working with uh, uh, many partner universities and research institutes uh, from uh, Israel, Technion, uh, from uh, the Netherlands, uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to try to learn from the best uh, how to uh, uh, increase uh, food production, how to maximize uh, food production in the space we have. And so urban farming, aquaculture, all these are, are very big for us. Uh, to, do, to, to talk about water as well, the other thing that's interesting is uh, uh, in 2019, the Prime Minister of Singapore announced a $100 billion plan. So we talked about $25 billion for a space program. Uh, and, and then I was like, $100 billion plan, and where, where's that coming from? And uh, it, it's $100 billion over 100 years. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's to guard against rising sea levels. But again, it's not, in, it's not just engineering. It's also social science. It's also um, nature-based. So, uh, one of the things they, they've discovered is to uh, guard against uh, rising sea levels. It's not just about building dikes and, and sea walls. It's also about planting mangroves, uh, which are actually much, much more effective over the long term and more aesthetic, and also uh, good at carbon trapping. Um, and, the, and the second thing uh, is health. Uh, this is a major, major problem for Singapore. It's the second older society in the world. Where the older society, except for Japan, uh, one third of the country will be 65 and, and above. No offense to those who might have already reached that target. Uh, uh, I'm going to reach that, uh, I think, by 2030 something as well. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, work now on, uh, 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 I've got to finish soon, I've, I work now on uh, how to make sure that with this very high expectancy, 86 years, and only 76 healthy years, uh, how do we monitor this population? How do we make sure that that 10-year gap is shortened so that the quality of life 
uh, improves, and you know, uh, all these issues about work-life balance and, and, and mental health uh, also come in. So I, I hope to have some of your feedback on this. Sorry for uh, blowing my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ruben. Our next speaker has a presentation. Um, we now have Nacha Tawiseng Kultai, yeah. Associate Professor and Chula Global Chief Innovation Officer for Chula Gongkorn University, Thailand. Thank you very much, Wendy, and uh, all the panels. And uh, good afternoon, ka. Sawadee ka. Well, on behalf of Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand, we are excited to be part of the Cornell Global Hub Network. And we do believe that international collaborations will help us scaling up our actions for our global sustainable futures. We cannot address our future or futures without critically examining the indispensable and evolving roles of university in societal transformation. Universities continue to serve as center of learning, nurturing futures leaders of our societies, and more importantly, universities are innovators, facilitators of change, transition agent for the futures. Public places increasing expectations on university as a trusted institution of society. Sustainable development goals are the core pillar of university governance. To serve as an agent of change for society and for sustainable futures, Dolanungon University vision is to generate and support innovations for society. And this vision propelling us to strengthen multi-stakeholders collaborations to serve society at large. Innovation for society start by understanding the true needs of the member of societies and of community settings, and then providing innovative solutions at speed. The solution are built upon three key principles, being relevant to stakeholders, impact and speed, and the potential for communities to connect, collaborate, co-share values, learn, and increasingly build upon each other's success. Leading sustainable futures through innovations, research, and education is driven by three key strategies. Future leaders, we want to create a new generation of leaders who is not only pursue individual international success, but also do care about social issues and aspire to make a difference in society. Impactful research and innovation. We constantly innovate and produce impactful research and innovation in a wide array of fields to solve societal challenges. We encourage our faculty members, researchers, and students to conduct a rigorous and meaningful research, develop innovative solutions that align with the needs of local and global communities, so we can all generate globally integrated and globally relevant impact. And sustainability, we work hard to support the UN SDG goals. We also collaborating with local and international organizations to support the work in these regards. We actively cultivate innovation and entrepreneurship in an open and integrated manner. CU Innovation Hub is a space and a platform for students and faculties and students to create and innovate and to put innovation in practice. The hub supports the incubation of startups, projects, and businesses that serve the public and advance sustainability. To date, more than 300 innovation-driven teams have been founded to create innovative solutions to improve citizens' quality of life. The benefit of these innovations have reached over 52 provinces in Thailand and benefit millions of life. Successful collaboration depends on our compelling goals, or SDGs, committing by our teams, faculty, students, and partners who share common interests and enthusiasts. Tulalongkorn University research and innovation focusing on five themes, health, aging innovation, deep tech supercluster, AI robotic, biocycle green food agricultures, sustainable society, as well as innovative education. And some of our established startups are Napsolute, Biophytopharm, Microneedles, Tandy, Biome, and many more, covering smart education, smart utilities, smart care, smart tourism, smart business, and many more. Notably, upon the outbreak of the pandemic, our team immediately responds to the crisis, and Jula has been leading research on two Thailand-made COVID-19 vaccines. The Jula COV-19, the first ever MINA vaccine to be developed in Thailand, and is now in the third phase of human trial. 
a protein-based vaccine by Bayer Phytopharm, which is a startup uh, and a spin-off from Jula Pharmaceutical Science Faculty, has won a number of awards, such as CEO of the Year by the Mekong Post, uh, Asia Star in Frontier, and so on. A leading innovation include Viabus, a nationwide real-time transit mobile app that tracks various modes of transportation and benefiting over 3.5 million citizens in Thailand. Jula student, the co-founder of Viabus, was elected as the FROPE 30 Under 30 Asia 2021. And Jula engineering student team just recently won the runner-up award at the Spaceport America Cup 2022. And there are many other um, student projects that are working on innovation. So Jula Longon University do participating in various global movements towards a better future. One such notably international engagement is with the UNESCO Future Literacies, with such challenges as climate change, pandemics, economic crisis, social inequalities, and many more, the future is uncertain. The Future Literacy allows us to envision different futures and enact change toward those futures, and the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem help us turn those ideas into actions and impact. SDG education for global citizenship projects enables students from different cultures and regions to study and work together virtually as they try to propose a solution to a specific SDG project. And students are introduced to a local and regional SDG challenge and are led by academic mentor and industrial practitioner through a social innovation design process to come up with a novel solution. Um, early this year, Jula Longon University faculties do participating in Cornell Global Hub Salon series in a number of very important global issues. And we thank uh, global, uh, Cornell Global Hub for this. Uh, university need to continuously evolve to meet the needs of society and we need to move fast. The university role is definitely expanding. Jula Longon University do believe that through the visions of innovation for society and our three strategies, we can work together and moving toward a sustainable futures. By proactively seeking industry and university partnership, supporting local and global engagement, we can connect people, knowledge, and resource to solve today's challenges and to ensure a sustainable futures. Finally, I would like to include my talk with a quote from our beloved late King Rama the Nine once said, the prosperities and the happiness of the people and the nation are not the achievement of any single person, but it is a cooperative effort. I would like to thank the organizers of the Cornell Global Hub Network and the team for giving this opportunity for all of us to come together and share good ideas. And I do believe that together we can make a lot of difference to the world. So let's co-create, collaborate, and co-share for our sustainable futures. And I do look forward to a fruitful discussion for further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancha. So our final speaker today will be Rachel Beatty Riedel, who is the director of the Mario Ainaudi Center for International Studies and the John S. Knight Professor of International Studies at uh, Sorry, that was only one of your, um, also faculty member in government and a faculty member in the new Jeb E. Brooks School of Public Policy. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Wendy, and thanks to my co-panelists. Thanks to everyone for their participation. As the last formal speaker, one might think that I have the easiest job because I can build on what you've all have said and, you know, uh, collaborate around your wisdom, not co-opt. Uh, but one might also think that it's challenging because so much has been said. And so I hope to bring a little bit of synthesis to some of the ideas that you all have shared. And in doing so, I wanted to address the question, what are the greatest challenges? What are the tensions that we've addressed and discussed in addressing those challenges? And what ideas and opportunities do we have for collaboration, both in ethos, in imagination, and in practice to address these challenges? So I want to highlight four. The first is a one atop a, a challenge that has spanned all of the panels that we've had today. And it's a question of access, and reaching back into yesterday as well. A question of access to water, and of access to knowledge in higher education, access to resources, whether in space, on land, in water, and access to health and well-being. Our water panel began today with a conversation of international and intracommunal questions of distribution, which is fundamentally about access, 
Alex Flecker helped us to visualize and imagine which rivers gets which dams, which types of dams can be optimally ecologically valuable. And then there are also related questions then of who has energy production from those rivers? Who has agricultural production from those waters? Who has drink safe drinking water and in what spaces? So I wanted to add to that question of access the avenues and ideas for collaborating around what role for governance, what role for institutions, what role for policy, what role for anthropological understandings, what role for history, what role for imagining of the future. And therefore, varied perspectives across our global partners, the ways in which we bring together different communities and stakeholders within and well beyond the contours and the boundaries of what we might call the nation state, uh, what we might call the countries that our institutions represent, and that we're geographically located within, but in, and in some senses, we're in many ways governed by those countries, right, in the ways in which their rules and laws govern higher education within each country. But we go beyond those limits in terms of thinking about our own perspectives and knowledge that are taken from communities, whether they be urban or rural, uh, what connection we have to the lands on which we're located, and the resources that they represent, the knowledge pathways that we've gained, the water and health that we uh, take advantage of or seek access to, and where we're all positioned in a global and yet fundamentally localized society. The second global challenge that I want to bring together across all of the panels is that of responsibility. And this is actually something that just that Annika just mentioned, and I think several of our panelists have, have mentioned throughout the two days, in terms of the ethics of collaboration and practices of reciprocity. So as Anandita Banerjee um, just uh, uh, told us in the prior panel, to imagine and implement the ethics of the frontiers of the future. At all of our sites, previously we, we know boundaries and we know barriers, but how do we go beyond that to generate knowledge about what each side of a bilateral relationship and what multilateral partnerships can bring, what we each need, what we each want, what we can each contribute, and how we can think about the truly mutually beneficial nature of those collaborations. Wendy spoke in a question earlier today about the tensions of privatization, whether private practices and ownership disrupt natural cycles, change our responses to shared ecological events, or private practices actually construct barriers to communal understandings of public goods and delivery. Ravi Kambor recently in our UK launch of this uh, Global Grand Challenges and Global Hubs Partnership talked about intergenerational and intragenerational questions of distribution, of access, of justice, the ways in which the costs that we are incurring on our climate and our environment and our planet have distributional uh, consequences, of course, among what we call the global north, the global south, our communities here in New York State, in Ithaca, and just those who live beyond Ithaca, but also in intergenerational terms. The resources that we use today, the space maybe that we pollute today, has consequences for the next generation. And so how we think about those questions in our own lifetime and across our lifetimes is certainly a challenge. It's, we can use modeling, we can use AI, we can use philosophy, we can use science and science fiction to understand this responsibility and then conceive of actions and practices that can in some ways effectively address this responsibility. The third global grand challenge that I see in connection is one of innovation, resilience and adaptation, and permanence. So yesterday, Vinita Shrasti from Ashoka University spoke about permanence or the traditional knowledge systems. And I want to return to this important point and the eloquent analogy that she provided of dance. In academia, our institutional structures, our universities, reward us for innovation. We've spoken so much about innovation, and indeed, it is important. We're reliant upon it. That's how we publish. That's how we get funded. But we are, in some ways, pushed um, to forget or move beyond traditional sources of knowledge and 
Our conversations have focused on resilience. We need resilience to think about um, climate changes, changes due to the neoliberal world that we live in, of racial capitalism, the humans that have created this world and yet resist it, resilience in the face of social threats democratic resilience, civil society resilience to the whims of autocrats or strongmen. And yet, the inclusion or the permanence of thinking about traditional knowledge systems is so important even as we incorporate the idea of resilience and innovation within, because traditional knowledge systems, as we know, are also never truly static. There is not one single truth. There is always a plurality. And so the varied ways that we think about the value of collaboration and varied types of knowledge and expertise from different contexts, always drawing upon different foundations of what are indeed original knowledge systems. But we're also actively seeking them out re-understanding and knowing history and tradition, even as we think about innovation and resilience. The last global grand challenge that I want to try to tie together for us um, across these panels today is relativism. And this is building from Chantal Thomas's excellent remarks yesterday. How do we know what we think we know? How does international collaboration advance that and or shape that experience? So we're asked to explore today the tension between respect for local cultures and the universalisms implicated in scientific inquiry. That is what we're doing in terms of thinking about global grand challenges and how we together address them. And so new perspectives require collaborative, heterogeneous inputs. And in some ways, relativism perhaps moves us away from anti-truth and its exploitation. It can instead encourage a broader range of perspectives on what we know and what we don't know. And perhaps that can provide some inoculation from misinformation or polemical stakes and instead move us toward asking the questions that have universal relevance, universal relevance to us all. That is the scientific inquiry in and of itself, but that also has nuanced contours that you and I each recognize from our individually rooted experiences, the knowledge pathways and trainings of discipline and backgrounds, and together we can come together to understand science itself more fully to train, to iterate, and then to pose the next big questions. That is what we're doing here together, asking the questions that drive our science with relative perspectives and stakes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. That was wonderful. Um, I think I would open it up to the audience. You know, we've had a bunch of panels on these different challenges. We've had a great set of wrap-up comments here. But maybe we could have a group conversation about the sort of challenges or the research ideas that jumped out at you or ones that we didn't include or thoughts you might have for what would be some of the themes. You know, I think we've talked about this dichotomy maybe or tension between grassroots and top-down and I would think about it, I think there is that tension, and I think we um, can maybe uh, think about it slightly differently because um, the way that research happens and the way that international collaborations get started is that you're usually curious about something. Maybe you have a research project. You begin to develop that in a particular place, and that particular place is maybe chosen because it's the perfect site for that research project, or you just really wanted to go to that place. And so if you're clever, you make the place that you've always wanted to be, a place where you can also study or do research, right? And then you meet people, you make friends. It then becomes a set of relationships that you are excited to develop. You take students, et cetera. And so we can, as a group, think about it as providing support at any one of those different stages, right? So we can perhaps, through the work that we've done already to have mobility across our institutions, we can help students get out the door, right, for that initial exposure perhaps to a different environment that might ignite some kind of curiosity. And then we can provide support that might not be, you know, we've said it could be directive or we're telling people what to study, but once they've made those relationships and thought of the research projects they want to do, help to provide some of that just enabling support to be able to make that research more possible. So the, the tension there might be one that we can 
um, get around by thinking about how people come to projects and how they how how they might naturally sort of take those forward and there are always these moments where it might be difficult to get a project off the ground or difficult to take students with you to go do something and those might be the places where we could productively um, intervene so yeah so why don't we open it up for other ideas you have for themes or or uh, thoughts you had during the different day of panels starting here in the back Hi, um, this is the panel I'm most excited about because I work for this great little organization called Cornell Cooperative Extension. And so the work that we are charged with doing happily is that we are supposed to be connecting the work that Cornell University does with our local communities. Um, we're part of a 106 different colleges and universities in the United States who are part of the Cooperative Extension system. Cornell is the only one in New York State. So. What I'll say, I, I'm about to be 11 years into my job. I, I work with 4-H youth development. So 4-H means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, but its purest definition is it's the youth arm of the cooperative extension system. So I will never consider myself a specialist in anything. I'm like a super, super generalist because I have to bring programs to youth 5 to 19 years old and train not only them directly, but the volunteers that are leading the programs for them. So our job is huge. And what I find is that I've had a couple really rich collaborations with, with Cornell. Um, and I'm going to say, you know, we, we've developed an anti-racism program um, in partnership with, um, with Pr the Pride program, as well as with Einhorn Center has had great work. I've had student interns running that anti-racism program. Um, so that's an example of one program that we use kind of where there is a translational kind of relationship. There's a need um, to be doing better work and extending our work. So sorry, I'm doing the long road to the question, I guess, um, but it took a little context. So <clears throat> my question really is, and I heard kind of Annika say it, I will say most, there are certainly some great partners on campus, but most of the time where I'm collaborating, it is because of my own hustle. It is because of me getting to conferences like this. It is because of me knocking on people's doors, telling them that we need them, um, and often being told they're too busy, too busy, too busy. The reality is, as practitioners, we are just as busy, and we are, you know, I think in order to solve these global problems, um, we need global collaboration, but we need to know how to get the information then into our local communities. So I really want to kind of push you all on the question of how do we really start developing programs from this research, and what are really some of the mechanisms and infrastructures that we can set up um, because even on Cornell, it's really hard to find the right people to collaborate with and doing a cold call or a cold email, God forbid. I mean, you're never going to get an answer. You know, it takes a lot of, um, of even though there's the animus is there, it's really hard in practice. And there are very few people who know how to translate research and practice and walk between those worlds and speak both languages. So how do we develop these programs? Um, and, and how do we get them to our youth as well? I mean, a few people have mentioned youth, but they're a critical part of this discussion. Um, so how do we get our college students and our youth kind of talking about this as well? Great, thank you, good questions. Why don't we take a few from the audience and then we can come back here. Yes, please. Yeah, so I'm Chuan Liao, assistant professor um, from in the Department of uh, Global Development. So I would like to reflect uh, a little bit based on Rachel's point on access. So from my um, perspective um, um, and my experience serving as a journal editor that receives about 4,000 submissions each year. So I see like in the past two years, I see huge, huge inequality in like the access in terms of uh, the opportunity to publish. Like my journal is one that is about development studies. So it's a top journal in development studies. And that is supposed to be like it's Global North scholars going to Africa to collect knowledge and then publish in those. And it's, and it's um, those who publish are dominated by, by scholars in the Global South. I, as far as I can recall, maybe 1% or at best 2% are published by scholars based in Africa. And then not to mention like a physics review letters. I just checked a colleague, uh, a physics prof professor, and uh, she told me she couldn't think of any papers published by a scholar based in Africa in the top physics like um, journal. So I just wonder like um, from this perspective like access, this is a, what we ought to do as uh, researchers in the university, right? How can we change this situation? Like I sometimes I try really hard to give like uh, um, scholars in the global south like a chance like um, um, send it out for review but um, but it, what, whatever the reviewers say is, uh, way, is beyond the, 
what I can control like an editor. So, so I believe we, we, we probably need some um, transformative changes. Like in, the, in, in terms of how we produce knowledge, how we disseminate knowledge, like what's the role of universities in, 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 in addressing that inequality? Instead, instead of just letting elsewhere, letting Taylor Taylor Francis to manipulate us, to, to like to, you know, so that, that's my point. I, I hope you, like there could be some reflections on that. This is also related to the broader theme of uh, inequality inequality to water, to natural resources, to health, and to publication opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Up here in the front. Just real quickly, uh, Randy Johnson with the uh, a fellow at the uh, Cornell Law School. And this is more like I'm looking at the end point. You, you brought up the word challenges a lot. In my experience over 20 years of lobbying Capitol Hill is we're seeing a diminishing capacity of staff or members to listen to substance or read anything longer than a one pager. And you can argue whether that's because of the politics and redistricting or is it because social media. It's reality, though. And so I'm suggesting here is, is transforming the, the great ideas that can get, get developed these symposiums into the decision makers, uh, who I would argue are probably less qualitative than they used to be. Uh, is a problem, and I think you know there's, and I don't know if that's true in the other countries. I was going to pose that question. It's certainly true here in the United States, I believe. And there's a real necessity. I know you know this, but to break things down into very simple, you know, sound bites. But then you got to get up there and sell them, and you got to sell them in the sense of hey, it's not just interesting. It's how does this help you do what you want to do? Because my experience these days is people aren't interested in learning. They're interested in, this is where I want to go. Now give me the research to justify where I want to go. It's, it's the reverse of what you would hope it would be. So that's a challenge, I think, for symposiums like this to move this stuff to the practical end. Thank you. Maybe if we, oh, Benita, please. Uh, thank you. This was really wonderful, and I think you really summarized the two days. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. Um, you know, I, um, from where I'm sitting, um, and where um, you know, I'm a positivist. <laughs> um, I'm very motivated by curiosity and looking for the positive and the hope, uh, right? Um, and I think this is what really echoes with this um, initiative and and the really what I think the global hubs is. Um, hope the agenda is, which is basically what is the next frontier that we're going to really work on uh, where we will actually solve something. Of course, there are problems. There are so many problems. You can't get water. You can't publish. You can't do it. But we are not here to solve those, all of them right away. I think the way you did migration once and, you know. So for me, it's like uh, maybe whatever the agenda or the challenge that you take next or, the, or we all take next as global hub partners, uh, we also look at what are the best practices? What are the solutions that have come, uh, whether it was for topsoil or composting or agriculture or food? I mean, I think the person, you know, your colleague who talked about food security this afternoon was, you know, amazing. I mean, I think that's really basic. If we don't eat, we don't live. So uh, I think if we sort of think of the global next global grand challenge as where are the solutions coming from from all our parts of the world? You know, there are so many of us here. Where are the best practices? Where are the what are the great good solutions that are happening in the local communities or in wherever, regional, national, international? And um, can we take those forward? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we turn it back to our panel and see, Eric, when you want to take the first? Well, um, I'll try to respond to the uh, colleague that mentioned um, access to journal. Yeah, I think really it's uh, a very important issue. Um, so um, I think um, that's one way that collaboration can, you know, solve um, this uh, issue of access to journal. And let me give you a typical example. I tried to publish in a journal, um, Journal of Economic Review, so I sent them um, my paper to them, and immediately I sent the paper. The editor came back to me, oh, we, we cannot publish your paper because um, Ghana is too small to make any big influence. And so the findings um, cannot really be replicated and all of that. So the paper was turned down. Later on in the year, I had a collaboration with a partner, um, 
Steve Young, he's actually a professor here at the economics department. We collaborated and we wrote a paper, Fiscal Incident Analysis, also on Ghana. And uh, he sent it to the same journal. In just a few weeks' time, we got a response, accepted. <laughs> the, the paper was accepted, I mean, without even much uh, uh, comments and all of that. So the key question is why was my decline, not based on the content really, but based on the, the certain where it was actually coming from. So that's really a problem. But really, for me, that is why collaboration is important. I think that the access was made possible because of the collaboration that we did. And so um, one way that we can bridge that gap is to have this uh, strong collaboration that, you know, between the South and then the North uh, to do joint publications, you know, so that you can penetrate into such, you know, uh, journals that always look down on, you know, the publications that have been spearheaded by people from developing world in, in a way. Uh, yeah. Um, anyone else on the panel want to take, Rachel, you want to address? Yes. Just briefly, I'd like to speak to uh, some about the first question and, and the third a bit about in terms of thinking about extension and uh, policy and who we're communicating to and who we are partners with in terms of um, the nature of our research. Of course, academics, you know, we get rewarded, so to speak, professionally for our journal articles, and those can be in specific disciplines normally, right? And so the way in which we are incentivized to do work beyond that, to do partnerships with local community par uh, stakeholders, to reach out to K through 12 or youth groups and the like, right, members of society, to communicate our research in ways that are legible to policymakers, right, using the right language, using the right, you know, whose problems are we solving? How does this research translate into something that is usable for you uh, as, a, as a policymaker? Those are above and beyond, right, in some senses, the day-to-day -day practice, unless it is the subject of your research, right? But I think that to Wendy's earlier point about the ways in which universities are kind of thought about, yes, top-down or curating, you know, to use that kind of language, can offer and shift those incentives. So maybe 10 years ago, public intellectuals, you know, the use of putting your work out there in media forms, I think was not as encouraged by universities or in tenure review as it is now, because universities see the value of that public outreach, right? The way of extending our knowledge into broader communities, in part because we need to make the case for what it is that we do. I think that's a part of our role as institutions. And so I think that the ways in which we can use university incentives to support, to promote, to help train that type of cooperative extension, that type of communication around um, uh, policy briefs and the like, uh, general op-ed writing, that is a lot of the kind of support that some of our centers and, and spaces on campus can do. And, in, and that requires an investment of staff, of time. Um, but it's one that if we are rewarded, rewarding each other for doing it, it also makes a difference. And, and that is also to the, the point about publishing in terms of thinking about the collaborative nature and where we are able to be published together. There are ways in which kind of local knowledge uh, can be put to use to advance the topics that we could only do together, right? That we only could um, extend this research if we are able to address it from multiple perspectives and with um, multiple ways of knowing. And then how that's written for a particular journal, you know, often becomes very stylized. And those ways of doing, we can share, we can workshop, we can produce together. And I think that that might lead through kind of collaborative sequencing from the beginning of research design to the actual writing of how our articles are structured can lead to the kinds of outcomes that we can all value on our CVs, but also in terms of what they do for the world and the communities that we're embedded in. Um, Tuan, can I also give another 
example because I've had the real privilege of being on the executive committee for another journal in development studies that is um, similar to yours but very different. Um, the journal realized, we realized that we were not seeing the kind of papers um, from scholars in the global south that were going to get published, they were going to get turned back, and sometimes it was a language question, sometimes it was a, a stylistic question like Rachel says, right? Um, and then sometimes it was uh, just the conventions of that particular journal. And so I worked with a senior editor who's fabulous, Jun Boris, if you know him. Um, he created um, a mechanism for having almost an apprenticeship for scholars from the Global South who served on book review editor committees and other positions within the journal who then are now sitting on the executive committee. The executive committee now is entirely made up of scholars from the Global South who rotate through the top position in the journal, so they are sharing the lead position. This is a journal that is owned by Rutledge, and so it has been a big process of working with the Rutledge editors to allow this to happen. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, unusual. Then because we wanted to try to support new research coming forward, knowing that there was a resource disparity, we've launched three different small grant uh, competitions, just a little bit of money that helped people to do research. In some cases, it wasn't always the, the norm to have research money to be able to go in and dislocate for that kind of, um, on the ground research. So we, we provided research funding, and then for four years in a row now, we've held what we call a write shop, which is W-R-I-T-E, which is a week uh, intensive writing workshop for specifically junior scholars who are looking to publish in that journal. And maybe they'll send it somewhere else, but knowing that the journal is a prospective home, that takes multiple faculty who are willing to spend a week working with each of those articles. They workshop them together. Sometimes that's more valuable than workshopping them with the journal editors and, and other faculty who are on board. But I think this speaks to um, a lot of our conversations because we can bemoan that inequality, but unless we find concrete, practical ways to um, get around or to build bridges across it, we're not going to change it, no matter how good our intention. So I think coming up with really concrete ways to be creative, to try to think small, right? We're not going to necessarily change inequality writ large because inequality is so enormous. But there might be ways in particular places where we have some autonomy or authority that we can make those changes. For a journal that received 4,000 manuscripts, so it's, um, it's uh, really impossible like you give like highly customized and individual support. So what we uh, experimented with is to recruit, uh, train and rec first recruit and then train junior scholars based in the Global South as potential reviewers for the journal. So in that way, like you don't have to, like journal editors, like they are all overwhelmed by the large volume, so you don't have to look at individual manuscript, but um, you, if those, we can engage them as a reviewer, they will learn gradually the, the, the publication standards, those kind of things, and then eventually that can um, um, gradually close the, the, the gap. I know that that's a long-term thing, but uh, it's just one step. But I think uh, something more transformational is needed instead of those kind of uh, incremental changes like we help, help like a small group, like uh, the system needs to be changed to, to facilitate our trans transformation. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks. Wendy, you would expect me to answer. I am the Associate University Librarian of Cornell, and I'm responsible for spending about 17 million each year to buy journals that are published by the top 10, top five publishers. I am very, very deeply moved by today's conversation about collaboration. I'm glad faculty leaders are talking about um, collaboration, sharing, and access. And I remember the first speaker, <coughs> the gentleman said, diversity of knowledge is the precondition 
of successful co collaboration, the other lady just asked, what are the frontiers we are hoping to take on? I would like to see the faculty and leaders to take on the publishing industry <laughs> to support open access, open science that is more trans uh, transformational because in addition to train the Global South authors to publish in Eurocentric journals, by doing that, we're destroying their local publishing industry. It is just like building the dams in their rivers that desolate their nature. We ought to think about our academic incentive, how we can publish in African owned journals so we elevate their visibility so that they become journals that count. They should not be trained to publish in the Elsevier's spring nature. Each year at Cornell, when my department send, spent $17 million, how I often think is there is drastic inequality in it. There are many people who don't have the $17 million who will have not access to the 17 million. And there are enough faculty among us publishing in those I need to spend Cornell's money to buy back. What about the industries in those countries, nations that we are so dreadfully wanting to learn whose knowledge basically don't count? So, so I hope one of the frontiers you will take is the publishing open science and open access. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm a bit moved with uh, those conversations, uh, particularly the journals articles, how uh, people, I mean, how academics in Global South couldn't easily uh, going uh, published in renowned journals, which mostly uh, Anglo-European journals. And yeah, it is really moving me a lot. Uh, and I'm really thankful for Cornell because I see two uh, Southeast Asian uh, <laughs> universities, leading universities, uh, NUS and Chula Long Korn. Uh, Maybe I am indirectly representing one of the leading university in Indonesia. I am from Institute Technology Bandung. Of course, uh, uh, you uh, know me. Uh, you know my university. Uh, this is uh, a thing that maybe I would like to add. Uh, I, before coming to Cornell as a graduate student, I was also a fellow for a Sustainable Development Goals Center of my university, which uh, making report for uh, like subnational report of SDGs and stuff. Uh, the thing that we uh, we kind of uh, have is that I mean we 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 understand that Indonesia and other countries in global south have problems that can be uh, researched or can be uh, look for for uh, new knowledge. But the problem is those potential new knowledge could not be gained without having uh, cooperation for the well-known universities, say Cornell, or maybe other Ivy League universities, or maybe Oxbridge. Uh, so uh, this is the thing. I mean, uh, maybe my question will be, how uh, uh, Global South universities can build uh, cooperation? Uh, can it be, uh, I mean, should it be uh, from bottom up, which maybe I will be the case that uh, I have to enroll to Cornell and connect to Global Cornell and getting opportunity to speak in front of you. Or maybe uh, Cornell and other leading universities also doing like a top down, quote unquote, to the universities in the area that will be the potential knowledge uh, source, say. So maybe that will be uh, my question. Uh, I hope I will get answers so I, I, can, I can talk to my colleagues back home. Oh yeah, this is maybe the case and maybe this is the way that we can uh, build cooperation with other universities in uh, Western countries. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I hear a couple of different questions in there and one is how can universities who are 
in places like Indonesia make connections uh, outside of the region and maybe particularly to universities that are here in this room um, or particularly to universities like Cornell. But a second question was about this sort of networking that might not be this bilateral relationship to a university in the global north but might be, you know, a more um, multi-sided relationship. And so I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about how they've promoted those in their own universities, um, not with the global hubs, but just sort of how do your universities think about promoting or actively finding and then supporting relationships? Yeah, maybe I could, I could take this. I, I'm uh, very glad that we have a, a Cornell student uh, from uh, Indonesia here. Uh, in fact, last, just last week, your president was in Singapore, and uh, I met the delegation, and they had, they had very, very good ideas. And uh, uh, th that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to work on in Singapore. I think yesterday I talked about sending 500 students from NUS out to the region uh, every year. Uh, and, and that's to, to break the, the mindset that, you know, the best is West. <laughs> to, we want our students to, to start learning from uh, our, our own region, local knowledge and, and local solutions. Uh, the other thing that we're also doing in, in NUS is to, uh, uh, be, because of the problem of excess that we, we talked about and the cost, uh, and Singapore is, is in the global south, but we are a, a very expensive country. <laughs> you, you, you come to Singapore, you, you, you know, you, it doesn't feel like South, Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and and we, we couldn't get Southeast Asian students to come to Singapore, even though we had signed agreements, because they said it's just too expensive. So, so, so we, we could send our students uh, th there, but their students couldn't come to Singapore. So uh, in the last few years, we've had to rethink how, how do we promote exchanges uh, beyond the normal exchange agreement uh, format. And uh, so just this year, we've decided we've got to put money where our mouth is and to fund the students so that they can come to Singapore and we pay for it. And we've decided that it's worth the investment because we uh, we need them to come to Singapore so that uh, uh, they can see how we do things and uh, uh, we can give them a much longer uh, kind of uh, um, a training in the, in, in the way uh, uh, we do things in NUS and hopefully this will build very long term uh, uh, relationships. So, so when we tried this with your president uh, last, last week, she was very excited. She's like, oh, oh, okay, uh, we, wh why, why just 10? Why not 15, you know? Uh, and and we'll, we'll put money in, in, in it as well. She said it's cheaper to send uh, her assistant professors to NUS than to, than to say, Cornell. Uh, so we're like, fantastic, you know? So, so we were willing to fund it unilaterally, but the, we find that uh, our partners are saying, we're, we're also interested in co-funding. Uh, so we've come up with a kind of a, like a small scale, uh, like a Fulbright, sorry, like a small scale Fulbright program. So we, uh, we invited 15 Southeast Asian universities to send their, their undergrads to Singapore. We pay for everything, so it's a big headache for my office now because I have to make sure they get housing and you know, they get the, the modules. And then um, of the 150, so 10, 10 from each university, or 15 Southeast Asian universities, and then of the 10, uh, five of them will be invited to stay on for masters. And again, it will be fully funded by, by NUS, not by, not by the Singapore government, so we're going to stump, we're going to put our money where, uh, you know, uh, where, where, where we've been talking about. Uh, and I think, I hope it's going to pay off, <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, we are, we're a publicly funded university. We have to show uh, the public that this is really in their interest, that we are keeping the talents in our region, we are learning from each other, and, and that we're, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to, to do better together. It, it's also because of the China-US tensions, I mean, to be frank. You know, that has also forced us to look within our region because uh, uh, that's imp impacting uh, academia, unfortunately. Can I add one thing? Okay. 
Yeah, thank, thank you for the colleagues from the Southeast Asia and Indonesia and Singapore. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a very good question, how we can link our global communities together because collaboration is so important. And as Professor Ruben just mentioned, um, in Southeast Asia, we have a number of networks, for example, like uh, ASEAN University Networks, or uh, we do have ASEAN University Alliance, and University of Indonesia is part of that as well. So it's kind of, we, we are interweaving, like linking the whole network together. Um, and there are a number of programs right now that are online, so to reduce the cost. Uh, for example, the one that I just mentioned earlier on SDG uh, education uh, and University of Indonesia is so part of that as well. So the students are able to take part in those uh, online courses and competitions that are going on throughout the whole year. And I think this is how we link uh, between the West and the Asia and how to make the costs as affordable as possible. Thank you. Okay. Great, uh, thank you. Just uh, trying to respond to some of the issues that uh, were raised by um, a lady there. Um, so um, I think um, in the past we've seen this um, kind of um, traditional way of collaboration between the South and the North. And I mean, often it almost seems like a donation, a project-based kind of collaboration. And so there's a project where they, they bring in some uh, faculty from developing countries and uh, then they work around the project and once the project is done uh, the, the collaboration is closed. I think that the collaboration in my view has to move away from the traditional project base what we call projectization uh, to more of a collaboration that uh, builds and develops systems and institutions of um, uh, universities, party universities involved. Um, it has to be more uh, multi-year kind of collaboration that at the end of the day, as we was talking about, the collaborative output would have value, will add value in each uh, party institution um, so that if there's a research output, the collaboration should be able to decide, okay, we'll publish in a local, in your local journal, you know, and that really would begin to build, you know, the reputation of that journal, um, coming up with uh, co-creating uh, uh, courses, uh, uh, co-teaching programs to develop the systems within these universities that really would add value other than just putting up a particular project which is time specific. Once that is done, there's no uh, backward linkage with the university that you know, the faculties are coming from. So once the project is done, there's really nothing else to show uh, with the university. So let's begin to think more broadly, more widely in terms of building systems so that at the end of the day, the faculties that participated would have developed enough capabilities, capabilities to penetrate into the global publications and vice versa, uh, so that together both institutions can advance or move forward in, in that regard. Thanks. Yeah, that was well said. Um, any burning thoughts or questions from the audience? Burning? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I arrived a little late, but I have uh, a concern about how to think about collaboration with different contexts. Like, uh, because sometimes in uh, some countries, you have some, I don't know, cultural norms or some legal uh, dispositions. Like maybe if you're studying race here, it's, it's, it's common to have the variable race. And, but in France, maybe it's, it, it's not uh, allowed to have the race variable or things like that. So I, I'm, I was curious about um, if we're thinking about collaboration between different, um, uh, I, I think, diff universities or research centers, uh, how do you manage projects like research projects if you have these specificities in each country? 
country or maybe not the same uh, restrictions because sometimes uh, scholars in the countries they don't they they're not able to to research whatever they want uh, so yeah these are my burning thoughts <laughs> No, those are good ones in their core to any collaboration uh, across places, whether they're local collaborations or more long distance one. But more long distance, the, the difficulties of translation are likely to be greater. And I think that's why international collaboration is harder. People have said, you know, it's difficult to do. It takes a lot of work across disciplines and across these national contexts. And you have to put the time in to come up with that different language of how are we then going to talk about this in a way that makes sense to both contexts. But that's, you know, not the problem, it's the point, right? That's, that's the value of, of that kind of work. Do we have any burning last comments on the panel? Anyone want to jump in? OK. Uh, no. Ann and Dita, you go ahead. I'm going to stand up there. And as I walk up, the floor is yours. <laughs> I have a burning phrase to offer, uh, and that is other people's children to care about other people's children. We are looking at the university as a reproductive system, and we have to look beyond that, I think. I think that's a really nice way to end on, right? The children are the future, and probably all of us right now are thinking about the kids that we have to pick up or um, <laughs> who are feeding themselves with the automatic Cheerio dispenser, which is what mine do. Um, no, I just want to thank everybody again on this fabulous panel. That was a heavy load to try to recap from a couple of days of a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions. So thank you to the panel. And just a couple of thoughts and nothing too long and definitely not very profound for 5 o'clock today. But I want to just pick up on what people have said throughout yesterday and then today about the value that we place on diversity and equity. And that diversity can be disciplinary, it can be um, identity, it can be geographic region. And to say that we value that internally, right, and also in this cross-national um, sense, and to paraphrase what Eric said so nicely, research that is produced without perspectives from particular regions whether it's Africa, Latin America, North America, are unlikely to be very valuable or maybe not even good for those regions, right? We need to have this kind of participation in order for things to make sense in all of these different places. And I think it's true that if we want to see that, we have to be very deliberate and we're going to have to be very um, top down in some ways, right? In order to build the spaces where that kind of diversity can really happen. And I think I've talked about this with a lot of you, but part of the reason for thinking about Global Hubs, one of the, um, one of the things that we wanted to build was a better infrastructure here for thinking about study abroad experiences for our students, where 85% of those have been traditionally to English-speaking countries, but particularly to the UK and to Australia. And we love when students go abroad, and we like it when they go to the UK and Australia, but we really wanted to see a better range of places for our students to be doing this kind of study abroad work. But in order to do that, you need to build programs, as Eric said. They need to have infrastructure support behind them. They need to have really good relationships. You need to know well where you're partnering. You need to think about how great it is to have those students here on campus and how to support them to be here. So part of the thinking about the global hubs was to build that kind of long-term relationship-based infrastructure. And in order to get a more fuller, a more fuller, sorry, a fuller geographic um, diversity across, uh, diversity across multiple um, levels. Somebody said they were surprised, was it Ruben? They couldn't figure out what the Global Hub was um, until Gustavo came. So that's what we're going to do now is send Gustavo places. <laughs> Anybody has any questions, just ask Gustavo. Um, but I think it, it has been tricky and we've gotten a lot of questions about it. What do you mean you're not um, hanging, hanging a shingle? What do you mean you're not renting a place? Don't you want to have a campus here? Don't you want to have a, a physical center? 
And it's been sort of difficult to talk about how these are different, how they really are based on relationships, and that we hope these will be long term. And the point of that is to not be in and out and not be dropping in from above in any of these places, right? To sort of uh, rent a space is easy, but to build these relationships is harder. And we want these to be able to support collaborative projects that are relevant in all of these spaces, right? Here at home and also in our partner locations. So it was quite deliberate um, that we didn't go the route of thinking about um, uh, bricks and mortar and instead really thought about where do we have good relationships and where do we have excellent peers and how can we then build on that in terms of this network. Um, so all of you are the guinea pigs in our Global Hub Network and this has been a fantastic way to kick it off with you. So thank you all for making the trip here. It was long and then we put you through a grueling couple of days. Um, but we so appreciate your partnership, your partnership when we reached out to, to begin discussing the Global Hub idea, and then your partnership in, in, in making it all happen and then in coming here. And we hope to take Ashoka up on the offer to host the next Global Hub. No, sorry, Vanita. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> the next Global Hub meeting at some point. And I think this is sort of the first step in building, and it sounds, um, I don't know, it sounds maybe a little bit hokey to say, but building a new language of collaboration. And I will say that I worked in Atkinson with Todd Cowan, who was here this morning. We, I was the director of the CARE Cornell partnership. So if you know CARE, a big organization, development organization, and Cornell, we tried for years to partner. They're a fantastic organization. The most concrete output we had was a 30-page paper on how difficult it was to collaborate. <laughs> so that actually was something we thought we should, you know, we should get some serious kudos for this because that was about the need for that language. So it isn't a small thing and it isn't an instant thing. It is something that happens over time. It requires trust. It means that people were, were going to make mistakes, we're going to make assumptions that are false or unhelpful and that if you have these kind of relationships that hopefully you get over them, you can say, no, don't say that, you look like an idiot. Um, <laughs> Those are the things that we need in order to be able to make these strong going forward. Um, so language, um, I think, is really important, and that's what we've hopefully started here this week. Thank you again. Um, And let me just take a couple of minutes. I know, I know, I know um, there may be plans and the light is going down, but I want to take a couple of minutes just to say some real thank yous. Um, the work of putting this symposium together, but also building the Global Hubs has been an all hands on effort by so many people that if I start to name them, we will be here for another day. Um, but I just want to, to pull out some key. Um, Shebnam Osham. So many emails back and forth, and with all of you, we lured her away from Georgia, and I hope she's not regretting the cold, so <laughs> thank you, Shebnam. And then I also want to thank Elizabeth Edmondson and Nina Chowpricha, um, who have put together this fabulous uh, <laughs> Um, kudos to the silent timekeeper. I have not ever seen a conference so well time kept, and that was a difficult one. And then I want to recognize all of the people who helped to, to decorate, to set up, who were here at you know 6:30 in the morning and stayed until 11 o'clock at night, um, doing all of the preparations for this. So thank you so much to all of the staff who did that. I should have said hold your applause till the end, but Shebnam really broke the mold here. So, but but I but just um, all together, I will thank all the people who work to build the Global Hubs initiative, and you know our study abroad staff in the Office of Global Learning, and also in all of your offices and in our colleges and schools worked so hard to build the student exchanges. Those were really new for us. We don't have university-wide student exchange agreements, and until now. 
Um, so that took a lot of work for our staff. Um, Cindy Turter is somewhere here, d d right? The agreements lady. Um, <laughs> So the study abroad folks, thank you very much for that innovative work. And then I have to really call out INAUDI under Rachel's visionary leadership, all of the program directors um, and program managers and the staff of INAUDI who are, you know, live and breathe international activity and are so wonderful to work with. So thanks to all of them, all of you who are here. Then also we have faculty leads for all of our global hubs and also subcommittees that cross um, staff and faculty for a particular partner and then they were partnered with your staff and faculty and we had multiple meetings online. So thanks to all the um, faculty leads who are here and who've been working very hard. Um, international services as well in Brandon's unit, the Office of Global Learning. International services, which is having to help us think really creatively um, about how to bring people here under the right visas. That sounds really obvious, but as we know, it's not. Um, so I'm grateful for their leadership, the communication team, and all of their work getting out this information. And Christine Potter, who's over there, who has been the chair of our Global Hubs Committee and also the head of the Global <laughs> So thank you so much to everyone and thank you for coming. We really enjoyed the last couple of days and we look forward to the hard part now, which is to keep building on this and figure out really what gets people excited to partner on. You know, we don't want to think of the partnership as, um, what do you say, a chain around our neck, right? It is to support us in the things that excite us when we get up in the morning. So we'll have to sit down and really think what are we excited to do together and how can we accomplish that? Thank you.